This is the Power of Thin America podcast, and today we've got an interview with Tristan Nazelrod, the reigning 120 kilo national champion. Tristan won the most epic battle at nationals, a legit three-way race between himself, the legendary Mike T, and last year's national champ Enrique Lugo. Now he's less than a week out from the North American Championships, returning to the international platform for the first time since 2019, and he's ready to make a splash in the Cayman Islands. Before we start, subscribe on our YouTube and follow us on Instagram at powerlifting underscore America so you don't miss any of our coverage of the North American Championships starting August 8th and the Junior and Sub-Junior World Championships starting August 24th. Our media team will be at both competitions doing press conferences, interviews, behind-the-scenes coverage, and more. If you're going to be cheering on the U.S. national team, show your support for the squad. Get a Power of Team America shirt or hat from the store. Link below. Thank you to SBD and Aleko for their continued partnership with Power of Team America. If you're looking to compete in drug tested Power of Team, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure to go to powerofting-america.com and become a member. Now, let's get to this interview with the 120 kilo national champion, Tristan Nazelrod. What is up? We've got the 120 kilo national champion, Tristan Nazelrod. How are you doing, man? Oh, doing well. I appreciate you all having me on. I've you know, been excited. I follow the podcast, so it's pretty cool to be on here myself. Yeah, man. Of course, we've been wanting to have you on. It's been like a total cluster since uh, Austin uh, with Sheffield and then um, all the high school and university Nats and then open open worlds and age group Nats and Scottsdale was crazy. Um, so just a ton of things going on. But yeah, now you're in prep for the North American Championships. And yep. it's your it's your time to shine, man. You're gonna have the spotlight on you now for the next three, four weeks. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, you know, this is the best time in training, it seems like. I think Mike Tushier, he had a post the other day. I think uh, he said it best where we tend to look forward to the day of, but ultimately this like last four weeks or so, that's the fun part, you know, and it can be yeah. stressful, but Getting under the heavy weight, that's part of the fun too. Yeah, and then just the added excitement of like being close to competition, like just dialing in, locking in every variable, um, thinking about every single rep, like making them perfect. I know like sometimes, so you have a pretty unique scenario because you went from the previous year where you basically just trained for an entire year from nationals mm-hmm. to nationals and didn't have any comps or anything like that. So probably like right after nationals, you were fired up, but then probably around this time of year, in the summer, you probably started getting a little bored because you're still so far out from your next competition. Um, how is it different this time, you know, having having the North American Championships here right in the middle of summer? Yeah, so uh, my, my year goes in waves because as a high school teacher, you know, my kind of off-season with work is during the summer. So I find that a lot of my best training comes in these summer months because honestly – aside from like side businesses and whatnot um it's just training so yeah. i can really diet in dial in my diet and make things work a little bit better so it's fortunate for me because by the time the motivation starts to wane and especially in a year-long prep like that was i hit mm-hmm. summer and i get to be kind of a full-time power lifter for a little bit and that brings it back up. Last year was unique because I was one so close to like getting that ultimate goal of a national championship. And, you know, hats off to Enrique who he had a monster day. He deserved that win, but to have the weight in your hands needed to win and not make it, you know, that's, it's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. But, I've been in that situation before where it's like, all right, time to saddle up for next year. And uh, I ultimately, I think it was because it was a full year prep. That's why I could put it together for this year, because I was just focused on that one day for an entire year. And I forget what happened last year. There was a reason you didn't go to the North American championships last year, right? Like you were going to, but then did you get injured? Yeah. So I was signed up and, um, that was probably the big adversity for the year. It was about this time, a couple weeks before. It was like the start of July. Mm-hmm. So six weeks out, signed up and everything, about to pay my team fee. I had just booked flights and everything. And uh, I was attempting a heavy bench press, and I just felt a tear in either my bicep or my delt to date. I don't know what it was. Um, but it bruised up like a serious tear does. And 
I just, you know, me and my coach, Bill McCarthy, we talked about it and I've trained through injuries before just for the sake of competing. And we knew that the, the goal was nationals this year. Mm -hmm. So as soon as it happened, we just called it off on North Americans, went into rehab mode to kind of get myself ready. So yeah, that was a definite uh, road bump on the way. Yeah, for sure. Um, I remember that. And you had a, you know, you, you made an amazing comeback, you know, you're a national champion now. Uh, we'll get into all of that kind of stuff. Um, but back to like what you were saying at the beginning, like these last four weeks, it's like, you're just kind of savoring this heavy training. Cause like, I mean, especially like in your case, again, it's like you had such a long prep, you had that injury with that you were just mentioned right there where you, that probably limited your ability to go heavy. Um, I know Mike T, you know, has gone through a lot as well with injuries mm -hmm. and whatnot and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I see a lot of people, I mean, a, another lifter that'll be competing against you and Mike T at the North Americans is Bryce Krawcheck. He also recently posted something about like, you know, um, definitely don't take these days, your ability to train heavy, don't take those days for granted, you know, enjoy them while they last, enjoy that process. Yeah. And it's the big injuries that, that remind you. And it's kind of funny. I think it's just a, a human thing where yeah. we drift away and we forget, we take it for granted. And then there's something that just takes it away. Um, yeah. And I had a, a similar leg injury after nationals this year, and I'm sure we could get into it at some point, but yeah. that was another reminder. You go from like the best you've ever been to way down at the bottom and it just tells you not to take things for granted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So before we get into um, any kind of details <clears throat> or, you know, into like, you know, specifics of training and stuff like this and your history and whatnot, I wanted to ask you, first of all, I wanted to say congrats on your YouTube. Um, you've been killing it on YouTube. I noticed you've been posting <laughs> a you. lot of videos. So yeah, I give a shameless ahead. plug, give a shameless, shameless plug for your YouTube channel. What it, What is it all about? All right. Yeah. So it is uh, Rod's Science and Strength Training. Rod's Strength Training for short, if you want to check it out. Um, basically, I, I had someone ask me a question about powerlifting. Honestly, I forget what it was. I think it was bracing with your belt. And I was getting ready to type out this long message. I had my dad, who had been in my ear about like trying out YouTube videos, because he does... Uh, YouTube videos for uh, basically educational materials as a side job. And uh, he was telling me I should give it a try. I was about to type a long message to answer this question. I was like, hey, why not just record a video? And then it's out there for anybody who ever wants my opinion on it. And uh, I, I kind of got hooked because I... I'm at this point in my lifting career where I've been very selfish. I'll be the first to admit it. You know, I'm focused on me and doing well. I've helped people with training and like, I'm going to a powerlifting America meet tomorrow to just help out as well. Uh, but I want to just give some information back and I've liked making the videos. So, you know, I've been posting two videos a day uh, since the first week in April. So I've just oh been goodness. cranking out videos. Yeah. And hopefully it helps somebody. The way I think is if it helps one person, you know, then mission accomplished. And I've been able to give something back from my experience with powerlifting. Well, I mean, so you already mentioned it, but you're a teacher by trade. That's your day job. Um, and so you're naturally, yeah. I mean, you're good at it. You're, you're good at giving informative content in a way that's entertaining and then also you have like, just, just preparing for this call, um, man, like your open powerlifting goes way back. So you've definitely <laughs> got a lot of experience. You've got a lot of things that you can teach people. And, um, in fact, like one of the things I'll, I'll ask you some stuff about like, you know, advice to give younger athletes and stuff like that at some point on this call, but yeah, it's good. It's entertaining. I tried to kind of in the last like 48 hours, watch some of the videos and there's so much on there now that, um, you know, you could just spend all day listening to, to Tristan on there talking about all different types of subject. And some of it, some of it are conversations with other people. And some of it is just straightforward content. Some of it is kind of off the cuff stuff that you do, like, um, 
uh, voiceovers on top that you put on top of your training lifts and stuff like that. So it's really cool. It's, it's, it's a mixed bag of different things. It's not just all like how to X, Y, or Z. There's a lot of just thoughts, you know, you, you think very deeply about the sport. Um, mm -hmm. and you talk, you kind of talk through your mentality a lot as well. Like, like in training, like stuff we were already kind of talking about already on this episode. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's good. I'm definitely, I'll put the link below. People should definitely go check it out, subscribe to it. And do you go by Rod or do you go by Tristan? So, so that's where it, it came from. I, I go by Tristan from yeah. most everyone who knows me. Um, obviously at school, uh, Mr. Nasal Rod is what it is. A lot of students will just be like, hey, Rod. And I'm, I'm not. Uh, and this is an opinion based thing. But yeah. I'm not one of those teachers who's a huge stickler on like, you have to call me Mr. and my full last name. Yeah, um, yeah. As long as we have that professional relationship with learning, then I'm totally fine with it. And I was trying to come up with something catchy for for the title. And I just don't think Tristan flows off the tongue. Neither does Nasal Rod, let's be honest. Yeah. So I went with uh, <laughs> Rod Strength Training, yeah. Okay. All right. So maybe we start calling you Rod and stuff uh, at meets and stuff like, so, so when we're down in the Cayman islands and we're, we're reporting live from the beach um, and we've got our Corona's in hand and everything. So Rod, how, how was, how did, was that uh, your day yesterday there at the North American championships? Um, yeah. I mean, Rod is definitely uh, catchy. It's interesting though, because I think I'm always like thinking about this from like a social media perspective, things like this. Like if I'm searching for you, can I find it? Um, so I would definitely put something about your name in the bio or whatever, you know, the description or whatever. So yeah. people can search it. Um, did you change your Instagram handle too? Cause right. Yeah. I, I lined it up with that name. Um, Rod, and Rod's strength training. Right. Because yeah. my original Instagram handle was like tank power. And here's yeah. a little fun background on that. Yeah. That was a nickname that I had way back from high school. They would call me Tank because I was the big football player yeah. slash baseball player. And then um, actually Mike Tushier, I think uh, maybe it was his email or his uh, YouTube or something was Power275, I think, or something along those lines, like had it in there. So I took the inspiration from him uh, to have that second half. But I just felt like, I don't know. I, I get uncomfortable when people call me tank anymore. So I was like, <laughs> yeah, let's not continue that uh, nickname, okay. so to speak. So you kind of went through a little rebranding then since you became the national champ, I think. Is that right? All this kind of happened since then, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, yeah. it it's funny <laughs> because my goal, so, so my goal with this is hopefully I'm somewhat relatable. I think there's a lot of really good you power are. lifters out there yeah. who um, honestly, there's people who do social media full time. They run a gym, they're um, power lifting coaches, things like that. And most people I think who are getting into power lifting and wanting to be good probably don't have that luxury to rely on social media for their income. So mm -hmm. My goal is kind of to portray, hey, I'm a normal guy. I teach. I love my job, right? I love science, whole nine yeah. yards. Uh, but you can also be pretty good at lifting weights while being a normal person. And I kind of hope to convey that. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, that was one thing about meeting you in Austin. I mean, I met you both years, but this year I really got to like spend a little extra time uh, in the hotel lobby have a few drinks the day after or the day uh, of your competition, you know, that evening. And um, yeah, man, you're just, you're such a nice guy. Like you're so easy to talk to so approachable. Um, obviously you, you have like an air of respectability about you as well. Like being a teacher, you know, like you're, you're not like cursing all the time, like a lot of power lifters and things <laughs> like this. Like I'm like a sailor, like I'm just like F bombs everywhere. Um, um, but you're just, you're like, I don't know. You got that like politeness and nice, courteous, you know, you're just a nice guy, like very easy to very relatable. So I think you're nailing on that. So, yeah. 
so yeah, it's good to have like, you know, rod strength training out there and then, um, and then just, you know, run with it and just stick with that and, and just keep marketing. I just did a search for Tristan, like on my personal account and you're the, as soon as I typed in TRI, you're the, were the top hit that came up. So you awesome. definitely still come up as, you know, when people search for you that way as well. So, so yeah, no, no, I like it. Um, and I've been, I've been, I know that you've been posting stuff on YouTube because I've been seeing it like on your story and stuff, mm -hmm. you'll post the links and I've watched a handful of them through clicking on your link. Um, but then now when I went over there, uh, like a couple of days ago, just to like, look closer, I was like, damn, this has really blown up. There are a lot of videos over here now. So people, if you're not on top of it, you could spend a whole weekend watching this stuff now <laughs> and really get to know Tristan. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so is, is there anything else you want to add about the, the YouTube or otherwise I got another question for you about current events? Yeah, overall, I mean, if anyone, if you do check it out, feel free. I, I try and be as approachable as possible. I would say Instagram, as far as social media, like messages, mm -hmm. that's the best place to directly ask me a question. But if you want me to make a video on something, you know, shoot it my way and I'll be happy to do it. But otherwise, that's about it, I think. Yeah. And I mean, I think you, if someone comments on the videos with questions on YouTube as well, you reply to those comments over there as well on oh, YouTube, yeah. right? So if people comment on there, that's a good way to get the engagement going over there. Um, you know, leave comments on his YouTube about what you like and what you want to see more of. Yeah, definitely. And don't forget to subscribe. <laughs> I feel like oh, I yes. always feel so <laughs> lame. One saying stuff like that I like that's why you almost hear like none of that on the power of the america podcast i've never like give us ratings or subscribe and so i just it's just a little too much for me um but subscribe to tristan's i'll sell other people's stuff but just just my all right let's more go. difficult <laughs> so you're a football guy you know you're you're a team sports guy in the past you play baseball you play mm -hmm. football have you been watching this uh quarterback documentary series on netflix so I mean, actually Funny enough, I, I really enjoy sports. I really respect yeah. anyone who does sports. I struggle to be a watcher of sports. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so I actually don't follow any sports really closely myself. Okay. And I was bitten. I, I like to say when I was in sixth grade, right, I became this really intense fan. I, I was starting to play football. So I started following the Patriots. Long story short, my dad liked the New York team, so I had to like be the rival team fan against him for fun. And uh, I chose correct because the Patriots were very good. And that was the year they <laughs> went undefeated uh, uh -huh. to the Super Bowl and then lost. Uh -huh. And I was like so into it. And when they lost, I, I had this feeling, and it was an epiphany. And looking back, uh, congrats to six, sixth grade me because – I don't know uh, how I did it, but it came to my mind, hey, I'm never going to let something that is out of my control control my feelings as much as this because yeah. I was upset that they lost and ultimately I had no input on it. So yeah. uh, from then, I'll happily watch sports, you know, like um, yeah. if I'm sitting down with family and football's on, I really like analyzing that kind of stuff. but emotionally i just don't let myself get connected too much oh that's that's very wise man um and it's crazy that you mentioned that that game was on during sixth grade for you because i remember that super bowl very vividly and i was like probably in grad school so you're still a young man even though you're wise you're like this big teddy bear but you're you're still young how old are you right now you're 26 yeah 27 i i turned 27 in april yep all right. Yeah. Well, happy birthday since I saw you. Um, and, uh, 27. Yeah, man, you're still young. So, um, they actually the Patriots lost to the giants, I believe in that super bowl. So that might've been your dad's team. So he, yep. he ended up having the last <laughs> laugh, huh? <laughs> he, he did. <laughs> <laughs> He's rubbing it in. Um, all right. Well, I was bringing it up because, um, you know, they, they have this documentary series now and it's, they had basically mic'd up three quarterbacks and like filmed them this entire last season and um, it's just one of these really cool things that we're starting to see Netflix do all these different documentaries on different sports. Like they did mm -hmm. one on F1, Formula One racing that like really helped that sport to blow up in the U.S. Like whereas most Americans generally like me growing up in the in U.S. being in, in, a fan of motorsports and other all sports, 
never really cared about formula one at all netflix does this documentary like series which now it's like in its fourth or fifth season and i guess the ticket sales and like the amount of races coming to the u.s is just blowing up um you know the ratings and stuff and everything and then so anyway they've done one on tennis they've done one on golf like they've done them on a few different other sports now and they're doing a really good job and then and then this one was actually uh produced by peyton manning so not, not really related to this it's not the same series as these other ones but similar okay. kind of vein, similar vein where they basically follow someone very closely. They've got them mic'd up for all their practices and multiple cameras on them at all times. So if they say anything interesting, they've got a video clip of it and everything like this. And they basically walk through the season with these three quarterbacks, Patrick Mahomes, which is my favorite quarterback. I'm a Kansas City Chiefs fan. And then um, the other ones are the quarterback from Minnesota, Kirk Cousins, and then the one from um, Atlanta, Marcus Mariota. And so anyway kind of like three totally you know one makes a playoff but then loses obviously Chiefs win the Super Bowl and the other you know Mariota they didn't make the playoffs so it's like kind of you get all three perspectives of like someone who's like struggling yeah. someone who's doing pretty good but then has that downfall in the playoffs and then someone that wins the Super Bowls so anyway but Mahomes he was a baseball player and he's obviously a football player now so I was that's why I was like I know that you played both both baseball and football in the past so just kind of like what do you think are things that you could take away from being a baseball player, um, a really serious baseball player, a really serious football player that you still use to this day in your, maybe even just in your mentality and stuff as you approach powerlifting? Yeah. Um, the biggest one, the number one thing that came to my mind yeah. was as a baseball player, you learn to uh, have a short-term memory, yeah. right? So you strike out. You put it in the past, go out, make a play in the field, you know, or you've got your next step back, et cetera. If you let those things linger, that's where bad streaks happen. You know, mm -hmm. if you're thinking about the last time you struck out, you're probably going to strike out again. And it's got the snowball effect. And I use that exact thing in powerlifting. So whenever I, I miss a lift, which obviously that's not the goal. You try not to miss lifts in powerlifting, but yeah. It's going to happen in a long enough career. I, I tell myself right off of the platform, I give myself like 15 seconds to be just generally mad about it. And then I say short term memory, right? And you're on to the next lift. And ultimately, you cannot let your bench be affected by your squat or your deadlift be affected by your bench unless it went well. Because, yeah. you know, if squat goes really well by all means let that momentum carry into the bench press and do the same thing with deadlift that's that's a really good point right there um is kind of like that's such a just all sports kind of um takeaway mm -hmm. it's like you know when things are going good you want to ride that momentum when things are going bad you want to have like the shortest memory ever like you got to just be move on to the next play onto the next thing onto the next lift whatever it was i think i heard you mention before did you say that you have a rule about like what, by the time you put on your deadlift shoes, you don't think about bench anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's the thing. If, and I have this omen that follows me around it's third benches of all lifts. Those tend to be the ones that get me. Yeah, um, I'm looking at your open but, power lifting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, trying to fix that by the way, <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, by the time I throw my deadlift socks on and my shoes, you know, it's on to deadlift 100%. And I'm not thinking about anything else other than my job to pick up whatever's on the bar. Absolutely. And, and related um, to this, you know, like whole thing with Netflix doing these documentaries. I mean, I wish I would love at some point that they're going to do something on powerlifting, right? Like uh, that's like the dream because like they really like took a, a sport like, like F1 or which was so obscure in the U S to something like now mm -hmm. there's F1 fans everywhere in the U S and it's just like, imagine if they, if they did a series on us, um, like just how much yeah, we, would go, we would go from here to here. Like, you know, we would level up in such a hurry, but just on that topic of like, how, what's your take currently just on like, the amount of media coverage that we're getting. It seems like our media is leveling up across the board. Oh, yeah. I think, first of all, you all are doing a fantastic job 
Um, as a lifter, I'm appreciative of that because Thank you. I can just tell that you're going out of your way to, you know, show the great performances and highlight the hard work of the lifters, no matter what level, you know, and the fact that you're going to all of these competitions to do that. I think the um, interviews are a great addition because yeah. it kind of gives that insight right before and after. And all other sports seem to have something like that. So yeah. it's a step in the right direction as far as just like, uh, general interest from the public and like watchability, I think. And yeah. I have press, to give a shout out. You mean the press conferences? Yeah. The, yeah, exactly. Like yeah. every sport has, every sport has press conference. So it's just like a standard thing that you're going to see. So yeah, we got to do it too. Go ahead. What were we going to say? Yeah, exactly. I was just going to add in there. I have to give it a shout out to SBD as well. I feel like they have also contributed to heightening the, the standard as far as like production for powerlifting meets goes with Sheffield and their support of all of the national teams and the high level lifters. So, you know, yeah. that's very cool. Absolutely. Uh, SBD kills it with the media. I mean, they're so good um, and in Malta. They had like a huge team of people over there and, um, and yeah, they put up, they've, they've really set a really high bar when it comes to like the road to Sheffield series that they did in the yeah. documentary series. And I listen to the King of Lips all the time, Ryan Lapidat, and he's been talking a lot about how Sheffield 2.0, uh, Sheffield 2024 is going to be even bigger, more media stuff, more of this kind of hype uh, road to Sheffield series coming out and stuff. So, and then of course, like you mentioned, a lot of people don't know about this. I don't know. It's interesting that SPD doesn't ever advertise it really, or brag about themselves very much, but they put out a lot of money for the world championships for the classic open world championships in particular. I don't know what the story is with the other world championships and with NAPFs and stuff like this, but um, just first of all, they sponsor so many top level athletes, so many athletes across mm -hmm. the board, but they pay for a lot of stuff for the athletes going to that went to uh, Malta for the classic uh, world championships. And they pay bonuses for performances and things like this. And I don't, I don't want to get too into it. Cause I don't know, you know what the, I don't have any details on it other than what I've heard from athletes and things like this. And I don't know what the contracts say. Like, uh, it seems like they're, they're not supposed to talk about it because no one's talked other than King of the lifts a couple of times last year, like before Sheffield, where they were doing money comparisons between like the pro series payouts. And you saw some numbers being thrown around about the world championships last year in South Africa, how mm -hmm. much money SBD paid out it's a ton of money. I mean, it's, it's like a Sheffield amount of money for the world championships, obviously, because there's so many more lifters, there's, you know, 16, uh, weight classes and all this kind of stuff. So it's like, Oh, there's a lot more lifters. There's a lot more bonuses, everyone making the podiums and things like this, people breaking world records. Um, but they pay out a ton of money. So definitely they've, they've done the most to level up the sport of anyone. Yeah. And, and I mean, how often do you have a, a private company going out of their way for, payouts at an event that like the IPF worlds, you know, they're not putting on that event. So yeah. I don't know, just the things they do to, to boost up the sport. That's part of why, you know, I, I can't see myself ever wanting to support any other company like I do SBD. And of course I have a, a relationship with them, but yeah. it's for a good reason. Yeah. Yeah. And so do we as power of America, we have a relationship, a partnership with them as well, them and Aleko and um, yeah, they're fantastic. So, and like, just on the media side of things, like they're kind of like our Netflix, right? Like, I think like I was talking on a previous episode about this, like basically social media is the media that we have. Like that's, that's pretty much all encompassing of the media that we have for power of team. Um, of course mm -hmm. we now have Eurosport, which is like an actual media company um, out there doing stuff. And then we have I think, you know, SBD doing stuff, which is kind of like the super high end. And then, you know, white lights media also covers at worlds and they they're doing a lot of things too. Like they're, they're promoting, uh, meets all over the UK and stuff like this. They're now getting involved more in the U S as well in France uh, as, as well. So, I mean, but they, the stuff they put out is really great too, but, but yeah, I mean, like we, we're our own, these are all like companies that came up in powerlifting. So it's like, we're mm -hmm. all except for Eurosport. Um, so basically our media is all homegrown and it basically just is social media, you know, by and large between YouTube and, and Instagram. Yeah. So, um, but it's good to see, like, I mean, 
so I mean, you, you mentioned Sheffield. What you what was your take on Sheffield? Oh, I really enjoyed watching it. You know, um, it it sets the bar for you know something I love to be a part of someday, and that's you know new goals uh, yeah. eventually. And you know, watching it was great. I felt like the commentary was awesome. You could feel the atmosphere f- mm-hmm. through the screen. So uh, yeah, I I don't think there's a whole lot more they could have done to make it even better i just think they did a great job oh yeah and they're not they're not resting on their loyals by any means they're going to level up every aspect of it um oh yeah so it's it's if you thought it was good this time like it's just going to keep getting better and better because they don't stop over there they just keep pushing um yeah it was fantastic it was it was it was you know the biggest thing that's happened in powerlifting and then let's go into uh the world championships in malta and what would you thought about that yeah um so I, it was a very bittersweet thing. Yeah. I, I did indeed watch the one twenties, and you know, first off, hats off to Tony Cliff. He crushed a giant total, and it was just awesome to watch him and the rest of the one twenties compete. It was very mm-hmm. cool. I I felt like I was missing out a little bit, and you know, ultimately that's on no one but myself because there was a qualifying criteria that was set and i just didn't hit that at nationals but otherwise i i enjoy watching all forms of powerlifting so uh, i just felt like it was very good competition there's more competitors than ever i think at worlds Mm -hmm. and the competition across the classes was there so it was very fun yeah i mean just just at a glance i'm looking on the men's side right now the results 120 plus has had 19. Other than that, I think every single weight class had over 20 uh, lifters in it. Yeah. Uh, I guess the 66s and the 59s both only had around 15, 16. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was the biggest, most competitive. Um, and then what did you think just around, like, again, like all the media hype around it and everything like that? I feel like it was different than any other world championships with just the amount of like hype and uh, the amount of coverage from all angles. Yeah, I would agree. I think getting the Olympic channel involved and I ultimately I don't know how that happened, but it did. And I think that's a big step in kind of getting us out there. And I know uh, I saw some numbers as far as like views and they were way higher than at least what I could remember from past worlds. So, you know, things are just stepping up. Yeah, I mean, we're into the millions of views on the Olympics YouTube channel, plus whatever Eurosport, whatever numbers they got, a couple million or more. I always pull numbers out of my ass, so I don't know. <laughs> could be could be two million, could be twenty million. I think on a episode that hasn't even released yet uh, from Meg Scanlon, I said that there's like a billion moms out there. Um, I don't know if that's actually accurate or not. Um, we'll have to do some. <laughs> So disclaimer, any number that you hear come from my mouth, it's just probably a little bit inflated. Um, I was also saying we're taking over well over 120 lifters. So North Americans had to record an intro and actually look up the number. It was 108. So I tend to inflate the thing numbers a little bit. <laughs> hey, what's the saying? Um, 88% of all statistics are made up on the spot, including <laughs> this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I think my mine is, you know, I'm I'm probably within 10% on most of these numbers, but you know, that's a pretty big give or if you're doing give or take, that's a pretty big range. Um <laughs> but yeah, so um talking about the 120s then in particular, um, because yeah, I mean, tell us a little bit. I mean, how so I know was it the world championships in South Africa that you didn't watch? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I skipped out on that one because I was so close. I felt like, yeah. um, to, to being able to be on that team, I, I couldn't bring myself to do it. And I did tune in, like I skipped to the end to see who won. And I was hoping Enrique was going to pull it off. Unfortunately, he wasn't quite able to, but second place was great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, that was the first world since, um, so let's see, I started in 2014 and I went back and I started watching worlds from 2013 that year. So that's the first worlds in what, nine years or whatever wow. that I 
skipped out on because I was bitter. <laughs> and then you ultimately did watch watch it later or something, but you just didn't watch it. Live. Yeah. So I went back after nationals this year. <laughs> okay. So it took, wow. Okay. So you're feeling good. You're feeling confident and everything feeling good about yourself. You're like, all right, now I can take it. I now I can watch it. Right. Yeah. I finally got over it. <laughs> that happens with me. Like I record a lot of football games and I'll hear that a team lost, you know, like my team lost, like my Nebraska Cornhuskers are just been struggling, man, for, for years now. Mm. And so I record all the games because I can't, oftentimes I'm training on Saturdays or doing, you know, traveling to competitions, whatever. And, um, yeah. And uh, same thing, like I'll hear, cause I can't like my family's all in Nebraska and stuff. So I always hear like what happens and I'll wait till after they win a game to then go back and watch the games that they lost, you know? Uh-huh. So it's like, okay, I feel better that we can win a game. And then, but which lately, honestly, it's been, it's been tough, but the chiefs have picked me up. So that's nice. But, but yeah, so, yeah, that's um, for sure. but then this year, um, looking at the the one twenties and and did you watch the whole world championships? Like, do you watch, do you watch all the lightweight classes and all this kind of stuff too? Um, if I have time. Uh, so basically this year was very busy as far as the end of school, I was working on uh, my national certification for teaching, mm. which is this long process standardized. And um, I had a big physics exam that I actually took yesterday. So oh, wow. um, I've just been, cramming for that and so i have to pick my battles for those longer watches so i think i ended up starting them maybe in the 93s or the heavier weight classes just because i generally find those more entertaining yeah um and then i'll go back and watch the lighter weight classes um probably during the rest of the summer where my schedule's freed up some more Gotcha. Yeah. But you do, I mean, you, you pay attention to this stuff. Like, and I think I've heard you mention before that you do generally watch all the weight classes and stuff if you can, which is, is yeah. that's uncommon. A lot of people only pay attention to their weight class, maybe one weight class up or down, you know, give or take. And then, mm-hmm. and then that's about it. So it's cool to find people like yourself that are kind of like, you just love the sport. You watch anything and everything about it that you can get your hands on. Right. Yeah. And I actually, I, I love, watching the sorry you're... world championship um possibly even more because i think it's just more exciting with all the variables so say that again because you kind of just cut out for a second so lagging a little did, bit did, yeah but you're back but did you say that you also okay. love watching equipped yeah yeah so i think um i like watching my weight class and the classic side of things the most. And then under that is probably all of the equipped lifting, no matter what the weight class is. And then I have the rest of the classic lifting because um, I started my career in powerlifting for the most part equipped. So I know what the variables are like with knee wraps and the suits and the shirts and everything. Um, So I just think it's generally more exciting because you never know what's going to happen on that side of things. Yeah. I mean, uh, talk about that a little bit, because one thing with powerlifting America, um, that we want to do is we want, you know, the media coverage that we're doing for the classic team. And, you know, I get this criticism a lot where it's like, Oh, that I only care about, you know, the classic open team and, and, but really it's not true. Like we try to focus, we try to post equipped. Um, we try to post all the weight class, all the age groups and different things like this as well. It's just, happens to be that, you know, a lot of the open and the classic they're on Instagram more, like they post more stuff. They post like high quality content. So, you know, we're going to repost that stuff well, very quickly, very, you know, easily. But, um, I've been really trying to get the equipped side of power in America to like post more, make more content because I agree with you. I had never been to an equipped competition before until Orlando last year, which was our equipped nationals mm-hmm. and our age group, age group nationals and everything. And man, I got to say, like, it was actually the opposite in terms of weight classes for me. It was like seeing the like high school girls come out with their like knees just like wrapped so hard that they can't even barely <laughs> walk. And then see them like squatting these weights that are like really big weights, you know? And you're just like, I was like the whole time too, I was just like, are their legs just going to break off or something like this? <laughs> like it's because they have, you know, they're so little and everything. And oh my God, it was so exciting. And then of course, you know, obviously when you get into the super heavyweight men and stuff like this, they're just squatting like and benching like ungodly amounts of money uh, of, of uh, weights. 
And so, yeah, I mean, tell us what, what are the variables and what are the things that you find that equipped lifting has that kind of makes it a little more exciting to watch than classic? Yeah. So I, I guess I'll preface it with this, that I think lifting is so much more back to the relatability conversation we were having. Um, almost every gym bro, we'll call him in America, right? Anyone who loves the gym just for the gym is probably going to be lifting classically or raw, yeah. right? Yeah. Even when not any sleep. So as far as expanding the sport, I think the first avenue almost by default has to be classic lifting because almost anyone can watch and they can understand this person has X weight on their back and they could think to your, their selves, um, how would it feel to have this weight on my back? Now you move to equipped lifting and some explanations now have to be put in place for people to understand what's going on. Yeah. And I think once you've been in equipment, so like I've been fortunate enough to try it out, train seriously for a couple of years, but then, uh, then you get this respect for what it takes to be very, very good at that level. And it's adding the variable. So to answer your question, um, like equip lifters, you mentioned knee wraps. Mm -hmm. You know, originally those were designed to support your knees for safety. Uh, back when powering was a much bigger sport, they were a bit like edges. And now they've kind of evolved to these um, very heavy duty wraps, and people will crack them on. I remember when I was lifting equipped. Um, knees would bleed at times because they were just like that tight and the tension is that much. And whenever I talk about variables that could go wrong, you one have to time when you wrap your knees because if you wrap too early, your leg's going to fall asleep and you don't want that to happen before a huge squat. If you wrap too late, you're going to time out. If you wrap too tight, you know, leg might fall asleep too loose. You might not be able to lift the weight. There's all these things yeah. just having to do with one piece of equipment, a knee wrap. Whereas a classic lifter, I just throw my knee sleeves and they're good to go. But as a you just don't need that. Maybe sometimes people see them walk. Like, Why are they waddling? And someone else might be oh, it helps them more easy let's pause for one second just because you're you're cutting out um but you i got i got yeah, everything okay. up to you know when you kind of went through the uh the variables related to the knee wraps and everything like that and then when you started talking okay. about sleeves when you mentioned like your sleeves in comparison it started cutting I, i'll have to probably chop that part out but i'm gonna just turn my uh okay uh video off for one second just so i'll know that there's a cut to look for in here that kind of helps me um to check for it okay yep and, sure. and then um you're you're back now like i can hear you fine now i think it just takes a second to catch up again for real quick in fact why don't you actually just turn your video off and then turn it back on again okay yeah let's see, let's see how that let's goes see. how can i do that oh, there you go. yep Did it come off? Mm. There you go. There you go. There we go. Sometimes that helps because like the video. Back on? Yeah, go ahead. You can turn it back on. Okay. Sometimes that helps because like a video takes a lot. But okay, so you, right, were talking, yeah. you, you were talking about the um, all the variables that come into wrapping knees. And then how does that compare like with with knee sleeves in classic? Yeah, so like with knee sleeves, you can just kind of throw them on and you're basically good to go. They're not going to cut off your circulation. So there's a simplicity to it. And uh, as a viewer, there's that disconnect, I think, sometimes because watching equipped lifters, you see them waddling out to the platform and someone may ask, 
hey, what are they doing? Why are they walking like that? And the simple answer is they've got these knee wraps on to help them lift more weight when in actuality, there's a whole skill component as far as how to wrap their knees that doesn't get seen because it's in the background. Yeah. Um, you nailed on, on like one of the key things there, like, um, for coaches, th there's like a much bigger role for coaches in, in equipped because like you said, they can wrap a little tighter, a little looser. They, the timing of the wrap, like, um, some of the really good equipped teams, whenever you see them, like, like I, it was really apparent at high school nationals, um, with the Covington team with John Burford, who's the head coach of the juniors and the sub junior, um, national team, his, his squad was like, so on point where basically like as a person who was filming a lot of this stuff, I always knew like where their lifters were. And I always knew that when they said bar is loaded, they will be just like walking up to the chalk bowl and then walking out on the platform. Like right? right when they said bar is loaded every time, like they always had their lifters ready right at that key time. But you would see some of the other teams sometimes like they would be still working. And then, like you said, the lifter gets out there and 20 seconds already off the clock and they got to hurry up and get, you know, or the other case where they're, you see sometimes, cause it's interesting. They like pull them up out of the chair. They like help them, you know, the coach like mm -hmm. helps them. And that's just kind of like this cool thing that happens in equipped where you like see someone get pulled up and you're like, okay, and they must be up next or nearly next or something like that. Um, but every now and then you'll see them pull them up and then you're looking and they're like, wait, there's like two more lifters before them. Their, their legs are going to be completely asleep yeah. by the time they get out there. Right. Like the circulation will get cut off. So there's so much coaching game day coaching stuff that goes into equip that you don't really have as much of on the classic side. Yeah. And I think as a big fan of the sport, that's why it's so appealing. Mm -hmm. But if you get someone who's not as like deep into the weeds and powerlifting, uh, that's not as understood. And if you're just watching when they come out to the platform uh, and you're comparing equipped and raw, I think that's where the equipped is cheating idea comes from or that thought yeah. process or like it looks weird or whatever, you know, like the bench shirt. Um, but I will also say like, it's, it is, it's more exciting. Even, even when you don't know about all of the stuff going on in the background, like when you just watch what's happening on the platform, like when you see just a live stream, that's very much just like front angle camera. The interesting thing about equipped that you don't have as much in classic is that you'll see lifters miss like openers. You'll see lifters miss second attempts and then just like blow up their third, like yep. it's an opener. And it's because of these little variables that we're talking about that they can make these adjustments. Whereas like, if you come out and you miss a bench, if you miss a bench opener on, on in raw, uh -huh. it's like, it better be a hell of misgroove or else if you miss uh -huh. it on strength, you're not coming yeah. back out and getting it right. Yeah, and there's an adrenaline aspect, like shifting back to the athlete's perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. In raw lifting, there's, uh, I would almost err on saying, never do I feel like I'm in danger lifting a weight raw. Uh -huh. Like, uh, I'm just, within my capability, maybe a deadlift, you're like, you can YOLO a deadlift, but you're not in danger pulling a deadlift you just drop it yeah in equipped lifting you are lifting super maximal weights over your raw max and if you get out of the groove with a bench shirt you're gonna throw it on your face yes <laughs> or if you get out of the groove in a squat suit you will fall yeah that it's it's kind of um twist sick and twisted but it's like it's like sometimes people like will say they like to watch nascar because they like to see the crashes and stuff and obviously like people can die in that so it's like it's kind of gross but but in in powerlifting no one's dying from these missed benches but man they it will look like yeah. they're gonna, they'll blow it off their chest and then boom it'll just be like on their face like a split second it's it's, yeah, it's like that yeah. And so they really got to set the, the uh, safety arms and then the spotters and loaders got to really be on their, on their game, you know, um, talking with Mike Losa, he's one of the guys that does spotting and loading, like he'll lift in, in the 83s and then he'll go and spot and load uh, for like the equip day on the, which is usually like the last day of whatever comp. And um, he also mm -hmm. was a spotter and loader at world games. And he's just like, man, 
spotting and loading equipped is like so stressful. Like you, you can't take your eyes off this for anything. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So anyway, um, and then of course, you know, same thing applies when it comes like the bench shirts and stuff like this, like you can adjust them and you can do different things. And so it's just a different, it's definitely, um, adds in these wrinkles and it adds in all this levels of coaching and different levels of strategy. And there's different approaches that people take. So just complicates it more. Like you said, it adds in more variables. And then that, yeah. if you're a nerd for the sport, then like, that's interesting. Cause there's different strategies. There's now there's new things in the mix. 100%. Yeah. And like, as a science person, I think, you know, there's a ton of physics involved with it. You know, if you're um, using a bench shirt and you pull down the sleeves, then what that is doing is it's increasing the radius on a lever arm. So, you know, if you know some of those principles, then it can artificially produce more force for a bench press. So that's why someone can, like you say, miss a an opener or a second attempt, and then they go for this giant jump, and someone may not see from the front, but what they did is they adjusted the arm down and kind of lengthened that lever arm to change some of the uh, dynamics of the shirt, which is just so cool when it pays yeah. off, because it's just like, it looks like there's no way they're getting it. They make these little adjustments and then somehow it goes and it's, it's fun. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and then you, it really, it gives you a level of respect too for the coaches too, because it's like, they, they come off as like magicians. Cause they're like, let me just pull your shirt down a little bit. And then boom, you go out and smoke it. And it's like, wow, like, man, that coach really knows what he's doing. Whereas like if you missed your opener in your second attempt on raw Bill McCarthy is not going to whisper anything in your ear. That's going to get you to hit it on your third. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> like hopefully you got some extra adrenaline that you can get a, put on a better song. I mean, get a little more hyped and stuff and like that just hit execute your technique perfectly. But really like if you miss a second attempt on strength on bench, especially like you're not getting your third, like nine times out of 10. Yeah. And I would say, I guess that comes into um, most of the coaching on the raw side is purely like numbers and attempt attempt selection, I think. Yeah. So like if I'm missing an opener raw, that means my coach and myself made a mistake in the number chosen rather than an equipment mistake. Whereas yeah. on the equip side, um, of course numbers matter, but the equipment matters probably just as much as well. So you know, that's just a difference. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, I think like even on classic, it's more of like what happens in the warm up room too. Like if they start to notice that you're doing something on your warm ups, you know, they can maybe give you a cue or a little like correct, like you're bringing your feet in too much. There's like little things like that, but it's not stuff that's going to add yeah. a ton of kilos um, onto your, uh, onto your total by any means on game day. It's going to be other than making the right attempt choices. Like you said, that's the key thing for the coaches there. Yeah, exactly. Cool, man. All right. So, um, Getting back, wow, we haven't really gotten very far into my list of topics here yet. <laughs> we went off on an equipped tangent, which is good. Um, because the North American Championships, just to plug yep. it again, the North American Championships, you know, we're about three weeks out from the start of it now. And it's equipped, it's raw, it's open, it's also masters, sub juniors, juniors, it's everything. It's it has all, all the classes are there. Mm -hmm. So for anyone that's gonna be you know, you're hearing this and you're like, oh, maybe I'll watch a little bit of equipped. You can tune into the live stream for the North American championships and you can watch all the different age divisions, all the equipment categories, all that stuff. So it'll all be there. But um, going back to Malta again, um, real quick, I just wanted to talk about the performances. Um, I had it open and I think I might've lost it now, but I was looking at the performances. What did you think on the one twenties? Like, like, take us through a little bit of like, you know, your thought process on it. What were you thinking? Cause I think just looking at the totals a minute ago, I, I had this open and it was, it looked like you would have, if you take your total from Austin and you put mm -hmm. it into the mix, you would have podium, you would have finished in third, I believe. I'll yeah. open it up again here. Yeah. And uh, I would have been in the mix. If I remember right, I think Tony 
Cliff won with 952 and a half. This is just going by memory, so yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. And yeah, then um, is his name Muhammad? I yeah, forget. So- I forget Muhammad his last Sahad. name. Yeah. yeah, had 925, and then uh, the British deadlift specialist whose name escapes me. I'm Indian. sorry. Um, yeah, 906. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He did a 906, and you did. 907 and a half. 907 and a half. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, so it's fun. Uh, you know, I watched that. It was great motivation. And hats off to, to Tony. He he deserved it. And there's no way I would have touched a 952 t- two total. Just being honest with myself. Um, and it's fun to play the, had I been there, I could have placed whatever game. There's... Yeah travel involved and so many other variables uh, to where, uh, trust me, I'll certainly play that game. And it was a great motivator. It was like, all right, we're right in the mix. Um, But I'm not taking anything away from the people who were there and they deserved everything they got. Um, But it's certainly fun to be uh, considered up in the mix with the best in the world. Uh, And yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, I mean, there's a pretty big fall off there from Tony, you know, 952 down to 925, and then third place 906, which you're right around there with your total from Austin. And then after that, it's, mm-hmm. it's you know, eight, 895, a couple of 895s, and then an 857. So, I mean, there's pretty much, even on a bad day, you're going to total over 857. So, I mean, there's like no travel, yeah. food poisoning whatever, you know, no question about it. You're going to get at least fifth place or better. And then obviously your numbers, um, you know, at nationals, there were some things that you were dealing with going into nationals where you weren't able to train as, mm-hmm. you know, so, so you're definitely good for more than 907.5. So, so yeah, I mean, you might've been battling Mohammed Sahad there at 925 for second place. And that could have been really cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, 952 is amazing. What do you think about Anatoly down here in the 105 is putting up a 940? I mean, geez. Yeah, that was insane. I did watch that session, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have much would to have say. Finished, it's would have, he was outlier performance for sure. Tony's big, biggest competitor. I mean, is a weight class down. I mean, is is the closest guy to him here with a nine forty. And then, what's your um, what's your take on Tony Cliff? Like, do you know him? Do you what's your history with him? And like, like tell tell us, yeah, what do you think of him? Yeah, no, I've I've never met him, so I'll, I'll say that first, and I can't speak to him personally because I've never met him. Yeah. Um, I have followed him for a long time. Like I said, I uh, as soon as I got into powerlifting, one of my favorite things to do, I would watch the 120s at Worlds and compare my lifts to the the lifts in the flight. So it actually started with me, like, you know, I would be like, I want to squat on a third attempt what the people at Worlds are opening with. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how I set my goals. And then it moved up. I want to squat what somebody hit for a second attempt. So I was always kind of gauging my progress that way. And my favorite world championships um, of all time, any powerlift event was, I think it was the 2013. Oh, why am I? That would have been it one was of your 2013 first ones. or 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I I was not in it. It was Mike Tushir. He was battling with Mohamed Bouafia in South Africa, and it came down to the last deadlift. And long story short, Mike just missed it, but it was like one of the best battles. And I took a lot of motivation and how I wanted to carry myself on the platform from that that event but back to tony he got third place at that event okay i think you've been aware of him since day one right and he has been lifting for so long and so consistent he's a great role model for like um training through maybe an imperfect schedule i know there's been times where he's like trained consistently twice a week and uh it just kind of shows that as a power lifter, you have this long time frame to get stronger um, because he's, I think, getting close to 40. 
at this point. Yeah, he is. He's 38. I think he's 38. He was born in 84. Um, so he's around that 38 or 39, depending on when his birthday <laughs> is. And um, yeah, he's getting close to 40. He just, I was just pulling up on good lift. You can click on the lifter and it'll pull up some information like his best five known ranks and stuff. And like this last year, 2022, he did the Arnold UK on, on the equip side. So that's kind of why I was bringing mm-hmm. him up because I know he's been been big on the equip side. He's big on the on the classic side. Obviously, this total that he just did was insane, uh, huge total. And uh, for a 38 year old to be doing that, at, you know, and and to just run away with the weight class at, at the World Championships in the most competitive, most stacked, most hyped World Championships ever. One of you know, it's just it's very inspiring to see you know because like you're 26 man you got like over 10 years mm-hmm. more to go <laughs> to catch up to these numbers and you're right are already on the cusp of it so that's got to be inspiring yeah for sure and uh i mean it's easy easy to say hey i've got 10 13 more years of of training to to push things higher, but kind of looping back to what we had talked about. I also understand that uh, all of that stuff can be taken away at any given moment. So um, I I do try and just put one foot in front of another and say like today, did I get a good training session in? And I'll try and do the same thing on Monday and stack those. And eventually that turns into 10 years and maybe I'll be stronger, who knows. Yeah. And I mean, uh, I know the talk going into, and that's a great, that's a really good perspective to have. Like that's, that's again, like an athlete perspective, like, you know, you win first two games of football season, you don't start thinking about the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? It's like, you, you got to get through all these other games right. and you can wrap your head around it. Obviously you always have the goal of the biggest total of all time and like win world championships. Like that's out there but you're not focused on it. You're focused on like, let me get stronger tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And if I do that, exactly. eventually, eventually I'll get up to these kind of totals like Tony put up. Um, I know going into this, he was, he was talking about trying to break Dennis Cornelius's world record, which is 978.5, by the way, like what is, mm-hmm. what a world record that one is going to stand for some time because Tony is 952. Um, I'm going to open up here the his attempts and everything but um you know 952 is a long way from 978 for sure and he only missed one lift he only missed five kilos on his third bench so yeah I, anyway. I think if i remember correctly his europeans total uh, might have been 955 and i felt like he had a little bit of room i think he missed a bench and then he might have had a little room on a deadlift, or maybe he went for a big deadlift and missed it. I can't remember. Um, so I think realistically, with a perfect day, he could possibly hit in that 960 range, which once you're talking under 20 kilos, you know, you're getting close. Um, but at the same time, yeah. 20 kilos when you're that good already is is a waste. But yeah, for sure. all the credit to him. Um, hmm, yeah, I'm not seeing that one on here, but but yeah, he's this is this looks like a on good lift at least at, at IPF comps and stuff. It looks like that 952 is his best. But anyway, it's a cal, it's a big number. It's something to shoot for, and he's he's an inspiration. Seems like a great guy. It's interesting because you know how Instagram started this new Twitter clone called Threads. Um, he's been on it. And, oh uh, yeah. Um, you know we don't, with Power Team America, we have so many of our own athletes. I try not to you know, get our feed too clogged up with people from other countries and stuff that we don't, that I haven't met personally and things like this, but um, mm-hmm. I followed him, I followed him on threads and he's got some spicy takes and stuff over there. Like he's, he's active over there. Um, <laughs> I hope that he continues to do things in the sport in the UK and just maybe going on King of the lifts more and things like this, because he just seems like a really smart guy, a good ambassador for the sport, obviously he's strong as hell. So everyone's going to respect him for his numbers. And then um, he's opinionated and stuff. So it seems like a cool guy. All right. Um, yeah. I wanted other... to correct myself if I could interrupt yeah. you for a second. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think it was uh, British nationals, not euros. I think I said that, which might explain why it's not in the IPF database. But anyway, gotcha, that doesn't gotcha. matter. 
Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I know he did something, you know, he's done some, some big numbers. His, his open power thing is confusing too, because there's a lot of equipped stuff in there. So it's a, you know, a lot of, yeah, it's a, it's a big mess, but, um, um, oh, getting back to Malta, we're still talking about this, like we're barely going to get into like NAPF at some point, but we'll, um, I just want to ask you about a couple other things. So other like trending topics, if you've listened to other episodes, you know, what I'm going to get into here is, you know, the jury, the pace, um, and what do you, what was your take on that kind of as a, as a casual observer watching the live stream? Uh, um, <laughs> I have to be careful. I mean, you're, you're three weeks yeah, out. Yeah, I try not to ruffle feathers. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think it's, it's fair in my opinion that if a, if a list is close, it, it is up to the jury. They're totally allowed to take a look at that lift. And now with the instant replay being like this, yeah. I think it's led to more movement from the jury because they get that second look almost immediately and then yeah. they can talk about it. Whereas before, they almost have to go with what they saw on the platform in the moment. And I think a lot of those lifts that were overturned um, whenever I first saw them, I thought, what happened? Looked like a good lift to me. Yeah. Yeah. So an old jury who have to, to go by what they see in the moment, I don't think would move on those kind of lifts because those lifts are so close that um, your brain says, ah, it looks pretty good. But with the instant replay, now they have that like slow motion where they can nitpick on a little bit. And I say nitpick in the most respectful way because there are, can be small flaws. And one of them is like uh, soft knees, for example, on deadlift, where you might have a lifter whose knees are kind of bobbling back and forth from like locked to not locked. And I think that was one of the more controversial calls that, you know, we kept seeing here. And I think that stems from instant replay. Now, I don't want to say too much more because now it's just going to be uh, opinion as far as what you think of instant replay. I almost think it should be treated like um, a baseball game, or I guess it's football, where the jury moves if an opposing coach asks them about it. And then mm -hmm. they can look at the replay. And if the opposing coach asks and they do not overturn it, they say, no, that was a good lift, then maybe that should be your one challenge that you get as a coach. I think that would add a, a, a new element to the coaching side of things and make it more watchable. Because whenever you have a bunch of lifts that are overturned by the jury, I think it creates a little bit of confusion for the viewer and the watchability goes down. So that's kind of where I sit. I know that was a uh, very soft answer. <laughs> no, it's good, bro. Uh, you gotta, you gotta be a good diplomat. Um, you know, a diplomatic answer there because you're going to have these IPF refs watching you here in three weeks at, at the North American championships. So you don't want to say anything. Uh, I think, I think you, you know, I mean, you. so let's, let's, I, I think you nailed on something that, people have talked about, which is, you know, how they do it in other sports when they do replay. And it's like, that's one thing I, I do think I, I want the IPF, you know, look at other sports and how they do things um, and kind of take, take some <laughs> guidance from how they've done it because the, you can learn from the mistakes that they've already made in these other sports and you can learn what works. And I do like what you said there about um, having like a challenge or even before when the jury just had no replay, I thought there was an element of strategy, when to challenge, what to say when you go to the jury, like, uh, like someone like Bill McCarthy, your coach, for instance, he knows Susie, Susie Gary, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about what happened with Enrique at nationals with his third deadlift, those kind of experienced seasoned coaches, they know how to approach the jury in a way they know what to say to the jury to be convincing and then to get their point across and get a lift overturned, however, which way they wanted to go. Um, and by just having the yeah. jury do it, it kind of takes that away, which is, you could say it could make it a little more of a level playing field for the people who don't have 
as great of coaches and stuff like that. But in my opinion, that, that adds in a, a level of strategy, which is fun. Like, you, like we were already talking about how equipped has all this strategy and there's extra variables and stuff. This is like one of our few little things that we have an element of strategy where when to challenge, when not to, and kind of take that away yeah. with this, with this. So, um, but if they get more calls right in the end, I think everyone would like that better. And if, if they can find a way to do it where it doesn't interrupt the viewing experience as much or where it's not confusing, where someone gets a lift and then they go to break and then you come back and it's like, Oh, that's lift is off the board. And you're like, what happened? You know, you, you know, and the commentators yeah. don't have time to catch them up to speed and stuff. So definitely, um, and definitely. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think there's even like what it comes down to, because you said like, we want more right calls. Yeah. There's some subjectivity in just like even that sentence. Cause yep. is it right? As far as like what your gut tells you on the first view of the lift or yeah. like as a casual watcher. Um, and obviously if a lift gets two whites and one red, at least two of the judges thought it was right in the moment. Yeah. Or is right um, by the rule book 100% correct. Yeah. And it could go either way. And I think both answers are correct. Yeah. In, yeah. in the end, like, so, I mean, we can, we can, we talk about this in another sport, like where's the strike zone exactly in, in baseball, right? Mm -hmm. like, it's a subjective range that one umpire is going to have uh, a tighter strike zone than another umpire. And, you know, now I think in baseball, they have like, do they do instant replay for strike zone for strikes and stuff now? I don't think so. Do they? Uh, strikes and balls? I, I honestly I don't, think don't so. know. I don't think they do, but I know the viewer can see that square. Yeah. To yeah. Like know if the call was good or not. Um, yeah. But as a baseball player, I remember that being part of the strategy. You would just know, Hey, this umpire calls outside strikes or exactly. he calls low strikes. Um, and that's part of the fun. So yeah, it's going back to exactly what we were just talking about. Yeah. Being adaptable as an athlete, like that, you know, you, and now you got to pay attention. You got to know, Hey, look at the jury out there. These guys, they, they don't like this. They don't like that. You got to have a scouting report essentially on the referees and the, who's in the jury, who's where, and, and now that's what the coaches have to do. Like, whereas before maybe their skill set was, I'm good at challenging or I know what to say. Now there's a, a strategy involved with like knowing these refs and what they're going to like and what they're not going to like. And I think in general, just making your lifts like more undeniable is probably the best approach to go with because you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. So, but, it, and this happens in other sports too. Like that's a, that's the thing. I want people to take this all with a grain of salt. Like th this happens at, with athletes that are getting paid $20 million, right? Like they've got millions mm -hmm. of dollars on the line and a, a flag in football or a call, a ball or strike in baseball can make the difference. And I mean, that's sports, baby. Like, you know, like when you sign up to play a yep. sport, like that's what you're going to get. So I, it's nothing like damning about the IPF or with this, with these jury call, it's, it's, it's part of the game, you know? Um, and it's part of the game too, like to talk about it as well, you know? So we're not trying to bash them by any means by, by bringing it up or anything like that, but just want to get your take. Cause I knew you'd have a really yeah. good spin on it. Yeah. 100%. And, um, I think it's, uh, growing pains as well. Cause you're getting more viewership, which yep. means more opinions and more possible critiques. That's, that's it. Yeah. I mean, we care about the sport. That's why we're talking about it for two hours. Um, so <laughs> just like, in other uh, sports. yeah. yeah. I mean, they talk, I mean, uh, like for days after the Super Bowl, all they do is talk about what happened in the Super Bowl for like a month afterwards, you know, all day, every day. So mm -hmm. it's cool. We get a little bit of commentary about this. Um, the other thing was the pace. And what did you think just about, um, you know, some of the lifters were complaining, especially in the heavier weight classes. It about was fast. The speed. Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, that's something. Uh, and I've been in fast meets before um i pride myself in trying to train for that and i think ultimately just like training to be good at squatting benching or deadlifting um you just have to train to deal with the fast meat and the other thing to be said is um everyone else in the flight is dealing with it too 
So if, like, going back to the 120s, if Tony Cliff had 15 minutes between lifts, like a full full flight worth of people, and then, um, you know, Saeed Sahad, there we go, got it, yeah. um, had nine minutes, the shorter amount, and then you're comparing their two, their two totals, then fair play, I think Tony had an unfair advantage. But because they're all lifting in that same condensed time period, then that's part of the game. And, you know, you have to deal with it. And as an athlete going to Worlds, you have to know, because this has happened in the past where, um, you know, Worlds is run on a tight schedule. And usually how it works is you finish squats and they set a 20 minute timer and you're out to bench if there's not two flights. Um, and as an athlete, you just know that's coming. So you have to adjust your, your training to fit that kind of, uh, schedule. And a great example, I had an issue at junior worlds in 2019 where, um, it moved fast. I was used to a certain amount of deadlift warmups, like six mm-hmm. of them. And, uh, because it was so fast. And I had the deadlift warmups written down. We did it. And I remember there were situations with those warmups where um, I would pull like my second to last warmup. They would load the next weight and I would immediately pull the next weight as a warmup. And I got to the platform and I was gassed. Yeah. And like weights move slow. And um, I've adjusted since. And I only take like three, maybe four warmups for deadlift now, I know that I Pause. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, man. You, you, you cut out on that part. Um, you, you cut out right when you started saying it's don't worry about it. Cause we got everything up to when you started saying, um, okay. Now, now you only take how many warmups? For deadlift? Yeah. Uh, three, maybe four. Okay. So, you know, I've cut it in half and I take, you know, like today, for example, working up to 725, I would just do 315, 495, 585, 675. Four more mups and you're at 700 plus pounds. And that's just because I know on game day, I can't afford to take any more. So, I acclimate wow. myself to do that. And wow. as an athlete, you know, now I can't complain that it's going too fast. And and that's not to bash anyone who, who said maybe it's running too fast. It's just part of the game. And it's not fun. I'll tell you that when it's moving very fast. Yeah. Um, that was kind of the thing is like, you're right. It's, it's, it's fair for everyone. Everyone's dealing with the same jury. In the, if you're in the same session, you know, which uh, that's the way it is with these. It's not like someone's lifting on a different day in, a, in the same weight class. You always have the same reps. You always have the same jury. You always have the same pace. And Tony Cliff goes out, puts up a crazy number, goes eight for nine. Jonathan Keiko goes out, 27 white lights. Jessica Espinal, 27 white lights. Natalie Richards, 27 white lights. You know, uh, I think, um, again, I, I, I hyperbolize, so maybe one of them got a red in there, but, um, <laughs> you know, there's people who are able to do it in almost every single session where someone's complaining about something, there's someone else going nine for nine and having a perfect day, setting a world record. Right. So it's kind of hard, like you said, to complain, but that just goes to show though, like if you're take if you're the takeaway from this, if you're just listening and you're watching the world championships is this can happen. Um, you might have only eight people in your flight, which means you're going to like, Hey Zeus on your second attempt, you're going to squat over a thousand pounds. Eight minutes later, you're going to squat a thousand pounds again for your third. That's going to be really tough to do. Right. So, so um, that's something that you have to start to plan for and be prepared for. And like you said, um, this is no surprise. The IPF worlds, especially for these prime time for the best of the best, they're, they're, they've always been fast like this. As far as I, in the last few years, at least going back mm-hmm. to like 2019 in Sweden, they were fast and people were talking about how fast they were. I think this might've been faster than ever, but maybe barely than faster than it was in South Africa last year. So you could see it coming. Yeah. 
Yep. And hey, learn from your mistakes. If it was way too fast, uh, then prepare for the next one. And I'm yeah. sure that I will be blindsided by something, some variable uh, in the future. And uh, in the moment, I will be like, dang yeah. it, that was yeah. not what I was I was looking for. But ultimately, adjust to move on. I love that you said, dang it. Um, you're, you're such a nice, you're so, you're so, uh, such a gentleman. And, and meanwhile, I said, teacher filter. let's yes, be honest. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Down in the Kevin's where we're hanging out after your session and stuff, we'll get the real rod. Uh, right. Out, exactly. The alter ego. Um, yeah. But, um, or on a similar topic, um, people talking about travel and, and, uh, and, and, mm-hmm. and just before we get into the travel, the thing is like when you're comparing totals from domestic meats, especially possibly like a local meat or even a national meat where there's like two flights of 14 and you have a lot more time in between and you don't have a five person jury with instant replay, you know, it's just, it's very difficult to compare totals done in under different circumstances. Right. So what do you, yeah. what do you think about that? Like in general, people comparing totals, like, like we're, we were, we were guilty of it. We just compared your 907.5 uh, yep. at nationals. I mean, it's fun to do, but it's like, that's why when, whenever I did that, you were quick to be like, Hey, you really, it's still, exactly. you really can't compare, you know? Yeah. This is exactly what I was talking about there. Yeah. Um, travel's a huge variable time turnover between lifts is a huge variable. So yeah, you just, you can't, you can do it theoretically in your mind for fun. Um, but ultimately that's kind of the extent of it. And that's why nominations for these meets ultimately can be misleading because, mm-hmm. you know, who knows, maybe a nomination is from the ideal circumstance for a certain lifter and they hit a huge total with a 15 person flight, two flights and 30 minute drive worth of travel, you know, versus flying to a different country. Totally. Totally. So let's, that's a really good point. So let's talk a little bit about travel for a second. So I'm just like glancing over your open power thing. You've been to Costa Rica, you've been to Sweden, Canada, Belarus, Denmark, um, you, you've competed overseas more than some people have even competed in their life. Um, and so what, yeah. is, what is your take on the whole travel? There's this debate and it's out there on different podcasts and you, some people say travel doesn't matter. Some people say travel does matter. Um, depending on like kind of the King of the lifts camp is travel matters. And he brings up travel all the time, Ryan Lapidat, right? Cause he goes all the world championships and he's seen it mm-hmm. over and over and then different podcasts Two white lights podcasts. They're constantly harping on travel. Doesn't matter. It shouldn't affect you. There's other sports where they travel just as much. Like we're talking formula one, they travel all around the world, you know, tennis, they travel all over. And so what's your take on someone who's been to all these different countries? I listed, what is that? Five countries, five different overseas What's your take on the whole travel debate? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so this will probably be my hottest take in that <laughs> I believe that I'm just right. And uh, <laughs> if, I love if you think I'm, otherwise, you're wrong. I'm uh, forcing you to get spicy here. <laughs> right. Um, no. So I think travel matters to performance, but travel should not matter to your mindset. That's kind of how it is. Okay. And uh, I think anyone who's who says travel doesn't play any factor is either lying to themselves or they haven't traveled far yeah. to do the thing. And let's just um, real quick say, I don't think anyone is saying that. Like, that's kind of the straw man uh, version of these two sides that I've kind of made up this binary, this dichotomy between okay. them. But, 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 um, like for instance, uh, Steve Denovi, you know, he was saying like, you know, jet lag is obviously a real thing. Like everyone, like no one really disputes mm-hmm. that, you know, when you travel in different time zones, y- your body is attuned to a certain way for so long. And then suddenly you go and it's nighttime when it should be daytime, that's going to have an effect on you. But yeah, go ahead. So go yeah. ahead and tell, tell us a little bit more. Like how, yeah. what are the things and that I'll, how, I'll how preface can... it. Yeah. I haven't heard the, uh, the opinions of either side that you said. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. um, 
I hope no one feels like I'm attacking them. No. I, I think I came off a little strong, maybe. Um, no, but no. you didn't. <laughs> no one's going to feel attacked by Tristan Nazarod. They're, if anything, they're just going to want to give you a hug. I'm telling you. <laughs> so, uh, go ahead. Um, so go ahead. But no. So, and ultimately, maybe I should adjust and say it's not the travel itself, like from point A to point B but it's the things that come with the travel. So the different food, um, long flights at odd hours. So especially if you're cutting weight, I had a situation in Costa Rica in 2019 where um, I do my normal water cut. I had to cut about six kilos, five or six kilos. Um, I had a flight because to Central America flights up here are always early in the morning. So it was like a four or 5 a.m. flight, meaning I had to get to the airport a couple hours before that. And long story short, I like didn't sleep through the night yeah. at my normal sleep schedule. And I, I got there and I tried to continue my water cut, but I I was one full day behind of where I should have been as far as like where my weight was. And it led to a miserable like day before where I was sauning from 7 a.m. until like 9 p.m. almost consecutively. Wow. And I still only made it by like uh, 0.22 kilos or something yeah. like that. 119.8. Um, <laughs> yep. And... <laughs> That's a perfect example of, like we were talking about, I could have controlled the variable. So I cannot just blame the travel because I could yes. have just simply dieted down to be lighter. But the travel threw the wrench into my normal routine and therefore affected the outcome. You see yes. what I mean? Yes. And that, um, that actually is kind of the point that Steve Denobi makes is that it's that the travel there it does throw these wrenches and you have to you can adjust for them like you said things like food mm -hmm. you got to be more prepared when you travel you got to bring more food you got to like you know get there early you got to like you said like if if like like for instance natalie richards one of his athletes um was talking about how she she was her body weight was down before she even left you know and it was because she didn't want to have to deal with the the water cut and that kind of th stuff in addition to all the other things you got to deal with when you land in another country, you know? And so it just takes away that one variable that could mess you up. And so definitely, so you're nailing this, you're nailing the same points. And, and I think this is one of the things like, cause one, one thing I don't want to happen. And, and the Steve and I talked about this um, in the DMS was just, we don't want people to like placebo effect themselves into thinking that their total should just go down no matter what, when they travel, because that's not the case. You yeah. can overcome these things um, these variables like now pace and juries overturns and tighter calls. And it's a world championships. So you're not going to, it's not a PR. You're not going for PRs. You're going for gold medals. So it's like totals will probably come down for other reasons, but they don't need to come yeah. down because you diet or food or whatever. And that's, that's why it, the very start of my argument, I said, yeah. uh, it affects performance, but it shouldn't affect the lifter. Yeah. So like, as the lifter, I know that if I have to travel far, that could have an effect on the situation. Now, as we just said, there's variables that I can control uh, to diminish that effect. And if I do it properly, it shouldn't be a big deal. But as the lifter, as I'm flying down to, say, the Cayman Islands here in a few weeks, yeah. um, I will have it in my head that it will not affect me at all. Because if I get it in my head that it will, then it will. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yep. Um, so it's like a mentality of, yeah, doing exactly what I need to do, controlling what I can control, and the rest kind of takes care of itself. And it goes with the like argument that tennis players travel all the time and football players travel all the time. And that's why home field advantage is a thing, yep. you know, because travel is a factor and you have to take it into account. Exactly. And being a good road team is a special skill, right? In baseball and in football and all these sports, right. like, you know, definitely. Um, so 
like you've been to all of these competitions. You you told us this kind of mini horror story about going to Costa Rica. Well, it doesn't sound like it was too bad. I'm looking at the results. You still took first right. place in the open and in the juniors. And that was your last international competition. So, you know, you're, you, you, you yeah. do have a North American championship under your belt. Um, it looks like you only got one bench in though. Um, <laughs> so definitely yeah, the so day was rough. That's a story. Yeah. I had a broken collarbone. <laughs> oh my God. Out. Oh my God. So tell us what happened. Yeah. There. But I didn't know it at the time. Um, yeah. It was the most bizarre thing. Basically I competed at worlds in Sweden uh-huh. and, um, was looking for a nice bench PR in the warm up room. My last warm up, I felt like something like, like a little tweak is what mm-hmm. it felt like. Um, got to the platform. I think adrenaline carried me through for the most part. I was down. If I remember correctly, I only took a two and a half kilo jump from my second to my third yep. and like hit two fifteen. Yep. Um, and going in, I had hit a 222 and a half kilo bench, like in my prep. Yeah. So it was way down. We took the couple of weeks off after a big meet, like we always do. And my first training session back in, like at the bottom of a bench, it was just so painful. And I, I was like, what the heck happened? Uh, I, I was convinced it was an AC joint because it was like right in between here that was sore and it was like physically sore to touch. Uh, but I had North Americans, however many weeks out Too much. talking to my coach, Bill. Yeah, we were, I think we did one single on bench each week and there was no other volume because like the pain was too much to deal with. And uh, we got to North Americans and I did my first bench took like a small jump. I might've jumped from 195 to 200, missed exactly. 200. Um, yeah. And because of the, the discomfort, we called it on the third bench attempt. And I actually trained with that shoulder pain into raw nationals in 2019. My bench was still down a whole lot. I might've benched 200 at need. And I think I missed two or something along those lines. Yeah. Um, and then we did it. We took like six weeks off trying to heal the thing. And six weeks off of benching. I was still training everything else. And yeah. from there into the. Let's jump right back into it. We were just, we were just talking about um, the collarbone injury that you had at the mm-hmm. North American Championships in Costa Rica and just kind of how you dealt with that, how you found out about it. So you were kind of taking us through. Right after that, you went to, um, after, after the North Americans, you went to raw nationals, you went to a local meet and then you went to the Arnold and you were kind of giving us a little recap of that stretch and like what was going on with your bench during that time. Yeah. So we took a bunch of time off after raw nationals before the Arnold and came back about six weeks later and still had the pain. So I was signed up for the Arnold already. It was my last junior meet. So we didn't want to back out at that point. And actually my entire training cycle leading up to the Arnold was 100% in a slingshot. So I did not do a raw until I got to the platform, which was bizarre, but it protected that shoulder. And about a month, we heard, or I went to the doc to actually get it checked out. I was like, I need an MRI. Uh, it's got to be a ligament. It's been bothering me from at that point, June of the year before to February. And um, they said, hey, you have to get it right done before we can do an MRI. And funny enough, I was at the I did the x ray, but the insurance person called me back a few days later, like, hey, you've got a stress fracture in your collarbone. And uh, that's kind of when I found out, oh, it's been a broken bone this whole time. And that's why it hurt to touch uh, that area. 
And uh, long story short, I asked them, I said, hey, is there any way I could hurt it more by venturing at this meet? And they said, no. So I went to the Arnold and competed there. And uh, I still put up a decent bench. And then COVID hit. It was, I'll call it perfect timing. There's no good timing for COVID. But um, uh, then I got to finally rest it and actually heal that bone itself. But it was an interesting ordeal. Wow. Okay. So you're coming through totally clear now, by the way. Um, and, and there was a little bit in there where Perfect. I cut out, but I, I can chop it. Um, it's, that's a crazy story, man. Um, like you said, um, and it's interesting just looking at your, your, um, open powerlifting during this stretch, you were doing a meet every like couple of months because NAPF came, then Raw nationals <laughs> was like two months later. Then you actually, you said you took a lot of time off, but you did a local meet in West Virginia, it looks like in December. So that would have been also two, mm -hmm. two months later. And then, and then there was like a good, like five months. Um, no, there was only three months from there to the Arnold. So you competed a lot, man. Like I'm just looking at your open powerlifting too. Like you, your stuff goes way back to 2014. There's like a ton of entries, like 50 entries in here or something. So, um, but yeah, so getting back to the original question with this whole thing, was about travel and we were on the topic of like how travel affects and you've been to a lot of these places before or you've been to a lot of international competitions um and we kind of got a sidetrack on the story because you're i noticed that your bench you know what happened with your bench there and everything and it's interesting it's an interesting story that you're dealing with a broken bone this whole time um but getting back to this concept of travel what would be the things so for instance um you know you're three weeks out but our sub junior and junior um, world national team headed to the world championships in Romania, they're six weeks out. So if you were going to give advice to them, they got six weeks to prepare. Um, what, what kind of advice would you give them as far as the travel side of things? Because you're also, um, side note, junior multi-time junior world champion. Is that right? Um, no, I actually not won a junior. I have not won a world championship. I was multi-time national champion. But okay. uh, the best, I play second in Canada, and then third in 17, and fourth in 2019. So uh, I've been everything but, unfortunately. But um, I like to think that that'll save the great for later whenever I get that open world championship. Uh, <laughs> Sorry to mess up your resume. But, it's so big. Um, it's hard. You get confused because there's a lot of ones in here. <laughs> There's a lot of ones in here um, for placing, and a lot of that is um, nationals and like junior nationals, collegiate, NAPF. So anyway, mm -hmm. but anyway, so what would you tell these juniors and sub juniors going to Romania? Maybe it's their first time going overseas. Yeah, biggest one, number one thing is get there early because time will solve a lot of those issues whenever it comes to uh, like time differences especially when you're going somewhere where um you're going for time because it's going to feel a lot earlier to you than it is actually at the competition and i ran into that issue at battles that i did uh that was my first international meet in 2016 i was like literally falling asleep in the warm-up room just because i was not adjusted to the the time appropriately. Um, so that's my number one thing. Get like five days in advance if you can. I know it's um, a monetary thing sometimes where it costs money to get the hotel for those days, but it's worth it. And then number two is, uh, this is another pain in the neck, but it's something I do, especially before the meet. I actually pack a check bag full of food to eat so uh, food and water matter so you don't have to deal with some strange food and upset that before you compete um you can always deal with that after and that'll be a fun life experience to get to tell your kids someday that you got sick on some romanian food or it was amazing who knows but before a meet pack your rice cakes and 
carbs and everything you need in a check bag and then just use that. That's a really good point. That those are those are great tips. Those are pro tips from someone who's done it. Um, you know, I think we touched on two topics that you can make videos for uh for for Raj Strength uh channel. What I, I'm sorry, I messed it up again. Is it yeah, it's Rod's sure. strength uh damn it, I'm messing it up. Training. <laughs> Rod strength trainer. Nope. Rod strength trainer. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I got you two more topics to do videos on one is do one on the equipped, uh, all the variables that you were talking about, and then do one on, uh, travel, uh, 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 way into this travel thing and give it lay out perfect. all the things that people can do and actually give details about the food because people say bring food, but like you can't bring bags of like frozen ground beef. Right. Um, so maybe you have to bring like dehydrated stuff or, or what? Yeah. And, uh, that's actually so bit of a shameless slash preview. I have a plan where like there's certain things that I I don't necessarily want to share, like biggest lifts in these last few weeks on videos and like um for competitive reasons and who knows if it even matters. But my plan is after the competition is over, I'm gonna put together this giant video of like um some commentary each of the four weeks out with my biggest lifts and packing exactly that, like my food into my bag, my water cut dealing with the travel. So um, yeah, definitely. If anyone's interested, keep an eye out for that video. It, it should be on. Get that video out as soon as uh, North Americans is over because there's only like a week and a half, two weeks until the juniors in, in Romania. And I will send them the link in the group chat with all the juniors and stuff to get them to go all watch your, uh, your awesome. YouTube videos and stuff. So if you make anything specifically uh, like geared toward juniors, anything like that in between now uh, and uh, North Americans, send it to me. Make sure to send it to me. I'll send it off to them for sure because we want to win. Okay. I mean, and we have experienced vets like yourself. Awesome. You know, we have experienced vets like yourself that are a treasure trove of of resources, information, and stuff like this. So we want to learn and pass that knowledge down to the next generation. So that's one of the cool things that we have going. Um, so sure. yeah, that, yeah, um, that'll be a good one. And then let's talk a little bit about the North Americans. Cause you just mentioned you that for strategic reasons, you don't want to give away any secrets. <laughs> and let me tell you what it is going to matter. Um, because the North American championships this year, it's the biggest North American championships ever. There's 286 athletes from 14 countries. I got the number straight from Robert Keller. So if those are wrong, uh, that's on Robert. <laughs> um, I added up our team. We've got 108 lifters from powerlifting America that are going to this competition. Wow. Um, so when people talk about, you know, there's only, 16 athletes that get to go and actually do the world championships. No, because there's like 60 going to the juniors and sub junior worlds. There's 108 going here to North Americans, you know, so there's, there's a lot of room for international competition mm -hmm. when you come over to power in America, but, um, just pulling up your weight class, you got some shooters in here with you. So you're nominated in first. It is stacked. Yeah. I mean, we got Bryce Krawcheck. We got Mike T um and then this uh this guy from and belize Kaylin. Kaylin. yeah you guys are all the top top four of you guys are all um i mean so Kaylin and and mike t both have 887.5 nominated totals bryce with 895.5 and you with the 907 and so we all know i mean this is going to be a fun little four-way battle and then you probably be in the same you might be in the same session with ray williams jonathan averill um, these are our 120 pluses mm -hmm. and Eric Willis from Canada as well, who's a pretty well-known name in the sport too. So it's going to be a star studded flight probably. Oh yeah. I'm, I am excited just to get to share the platform with these guys. And uh, yeah, think back to prior North American championships Uh not to like downplay anything, but I think the competition level this one is as high as it's ever been, as you mentioned, as far as the numbers go. Yeah. Uh, and just like look at the resume of some of these people, 
Mike D, prior World Games champion. He's been a junior world champion before. Um, world record holder. I've got Bryce, who's deadlift world record holder in the past as well. Uh, he may have competed at the World Games. I can't remember, but at least the World Championship several times. Yeah. Um, Ray Williams, it's an no introduction. Eric Willis, prior world champion. Like, come on. It's going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Uh, it's a stacked session. I, I don't know. I don't think they've released the schedule yet, but we'll definitely be hyping this up in the days leading into it with the schedule and everything like that. Exactly what session and who all is going to be in there. Hopefully, it looks like um, just based on the numbers there, they could combine the 120s and the 120 pluses into like a flight. And that would be a perfect number right there. So that'll, yeah. be, that'll be awesome. So you get to see this is a stack session. So what's it like, you know, you, you mentioned before, you kind of started watching the world championships in like 2013 or it was 2014, but you watched the 2013 and that was around that time, like you said, and I've heard you talk about on other podcasts where Mike T, you've rewatched his performance at the world championships like over and over again. And then now, what was it like competing against him in Austin and then now getting to like run it back again at the North American championships um, and get, a, get two head to head battles with the guy um, in the last like six months? Yeah, it's uh, surreal is probably the word for it. Um, there's definitely a little bit of, and I've been meaning to make a, a video on this because it's, I think it's a legitimate feeling for a lot of people, but it, like imposter syndrome, because you look around and you're like, uh, look at all these world champions and Mike T who I've looked up to for so long and Bryce and all of these guys, Kalen, I don't want to leave him out because he's been crushing training and he's going to put up huge numbers as well. Um, but there's a literal part of you as a person who's like, do I belong? And I think nationals this past year really helped me get over that hump of like, oh yeah, right? Like I, I should be there with them. Uh, and it's just fun. Because I know that younger me from 2014 would like be in awe, uh, yeah. if that's probably the best way to put it. And I just have fun with it. Because how many people get to compete alongside some of their uh, role models in the sport that they do? Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's cool. Honestly, it's cool for everyone to be just seeing Mike T out there doing his thing. Like he's such a legend in the sport in the, on the coaching side and everyone who's mm -hmm. coming to the sport and, and anytime. And I guess the last 15 years should know about him. And so it's cool to see him like back. Um, he went through that whole injury period and things like this took a lot of time from competition off and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. to have his first major, his first major meet back be going head to head against you in a three-way battle with you and Enrique. Um, that had to be special, man. I know it was special for Mike. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it was good to see him just back at that national level and uh, competing at the highest level again. And um, I know like, cause we did the press conferences with both of you afterwards, you know, separately and everything like that. And stuff. So he, he, he talked, he spoke really well of you um, the previous year, um, the year when Lugo won. Um, I remember I, I heard him on a podcast cause I listen to almost anything Mike T it's like one of those things of like, it's like a Matt Gary or Mike T it's like anything yeah. they say or talk about, you should, you should probably listen to it. Um, you should soak it all in. And I remember him after the, the one where Lugo won, um, 2022 nationals, he mentioned, someone was like asking him a question about like, who do you admire? Or what did you think about the, uh, about nationals? And I think the first thing that he mentioned was Tristan nasal rod is really impressive to me. He's a really impressive lifter to me, the way that he works, his work <laughs> ethic and all of this kind of stuff. Did you hear that? Yeah, no, I, I did hear that uh, conversation and I actually had it sent to a friend of mine. Yeah, yeah it's an honor to, to be spoken of like that. Or someone like T. Caliber. And yeah, it's cool. I, I'd like to say friend at this point. We definitely have from Andrew's 
goes on on Instagram, you know, I'll I'll tell him occasionally not to out deadly by too much at North Americans. And he'll tell me to give him some spot numbers, but yeah, it's just fun. Yeah, are you uh, looking for? I mean, are, is there going to be any kind of like rivalry growing here between the two of you guys? Since um, you're going to be going back to, you know, head to head once again. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. What? Whenever we're in a competition, I I like to think, like, I know that I have a respect for him on the day of and everything he does but anytime i step on the platform i'm like going out there to win that's that's my objective and you know i i imagine he feels the same way it's it's kind of funny because he and i have such opposite uh platform presence on game day and even in the back i'm someone who paces around and then talking to myself like a crazy person and uh he sits there stoic kind of thing and i'm sure he's like who is this crazy kid walking around <laughs> but um it's just funny to contrast the two and uh, as far as the rivalry goes of course i think there's some friendly competition involved same thing with lugo i want to add his name of course i mean he's a national champion as well and you know i i'm just excited to have that uh competition at the highest level amongst the guys too i think are all great people outside of lifting as well yeah 100 um meeting meeting the three of you i feel like i feel like you're like the three nicest guys and like just good good people in the sport <laughs> and i think I, I talked about it on the recap of austin you know just like it's really a testament of just like the people we have in the powerlifting community that are really good people. And we have three of them in this one weight class and it's just, it's cool to see you guys battle. And it's cool that, that there's going to be this battle again at the North American championships. I mean, this is something really that people are going to want to tune into. Um, Canada has got something, some skin in the game, Belize, a small country that doesn't have a big name for itself in powerlifting, but is on the up and coming um, is going to be in the mix and then in the same fight, you know, we're going to have a couple more Canadians and Americans um, in the 120 pluses as well. And so like, this is going to be a hell of a, hell of a flight to watch for sure. And, um, d- but then having that little side battle that is going to lead up to again, into nationals again next year, where it's like, it'll probably be you and Mike and, and Enrique again. So it's like, we kind of get round three between you and Lugo and Mike is like kind of coming in and throwing a wrench into the mix of it all and everything as well. So it's, um, it's, it's fun, man. It's, it's good. It's a good, um, thing to get people's attention and really pay attention and watch the sport, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, that's a, a great point that I have to be my word this because I don't want to get seen like I'm past North America. I think, but my goal for North America is I want to make a statement as far as like putting up a big total for nationals, because ultimately that ultimate goal is to get to the world championships next year. And the only way to do that is to win nationals. Yeah. To, to win and also hit the qualifying total, whatever it may be um, next year, but also just talking about making a statement. I mean, Mm -hmm we're not super far out from the world championships in Malta. So I think it's a good time to put up a number and, and with the IPF referees, with some travel involved and whatnot, that will be a little more comparable where we can say, Hey, look, if Tristan had gone to world championships here, maybe where he would have placed um, and, and what the situation may be there as well. So it provides a lot of fodder for sports talk comparisons to the world championships, the battle at hand with these three other guys that are all capable, um, that are in your weight class, you know, and then the show that the whole flight's going to put on, it just, it's just fantastic. Um, well, speaking of this, um, last nationals, I was watching through your YouTube videos and I found one, uh, maybe two or three weeks ago where you, you talked about, you've got a chip on your shoulder 
And uh, I wanted you to get into that a little <laughs> bit um, because you kind of hit on it a little bit right there when you were talking about, you know, what the goal is for North American championships is you want to make a statement and, you know, people who have a chip on their shoulder, they want to make a statement. You know what I'm saying? So um, yeah. what was the, what is the reason behind what you were saying in that video about you have a chip on your shoulder? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I'll be honest, I, I am happy that I have, you know, the feelings that I do, and it's it's not to diminish anything as far as, like, what was said, and I'm extremely grateful things worked out as they did in Austin, so just to preface that, but walk away, I, I kind of, I felt like there was a lot of talk about Mike being injured on the day of for nationals like with his back tweak and i felt like there was a lot of talk about um enrique maybe he went through a period of like not being super motivated last year i I don't know the extent of that i know he struggled to make weight um and i don't know just the competitor in me felt like focusing on the Things takes away from the the victory yeah. that I felt like I had, and it was like these asterisks. Like I won because of these things, because the other guys were down, um, and that's just great motivation to carry through. Like it is a long and exhausting thing to be like a power lifter year round who's pretty hard. I think a lot of sports have like true off seasons, whereas in powerlifting, if you want to be very good, you have to bring that energy for an entire year. And uh, for me personally, it's almost like a challenge onto myself to where I hope Mike and Enrique have the best training year of their life leading into nationals next year. And I just know I'll be ready. And I hope there's no excuses and, you know, we'll see where the the cards fall. Um, but I, I also have to press that with, I do not think any of the excuses stem from Mike or Enrique. I don't think they were like saying excuses uh, on their behalf, behalf. I think it's just things that were talked about from the outside in, uh, oh, yeah. if that makes sense. I so actually... I decided, uh, it almost felt like to me. Go ahead. Oh, no, go no. ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, um, it almost feels a little bit like to me, like I, I got the benefit of winning the national championship, but I still have the motivation and the hunger of like, I'm hunting my first one all over again um, yeah. because of that. That's really interesting. Um, you you mentioned in the video too that it was like the day of the 120s that were that um, that you recorded that video, and like part of the chip on your shoulder was just like that you won the national championship, but you didn't get to go to worlds. You're watching it, and then you add, and then there was this second aspect of it too of like people were kind of diminishing. And, and I don't, we don't have to mention names or anything like you, if you felt that vibe, doesn't really matter if yeah, anyone yeah. meant it or what they were saying exactly. You, it, that's the way you took it was sort of like, you know, um, that it, that it somehow diminishes. And you mentioned before having like imposter syndrome, talking about going against these guys that are like world champions and guys like Mike T and whatever. So some of that could be internal. And you even mentioned in the video that you're like, highly motivated by like negative uh, extrinsic factors like this, like, and so I'm not saying that you made this up this narrative or anything like this, but like me with my numbers and stuff, like maybe you um, blew it a little more out of proportion um, in a way that's self-serving because it helps motivate you. Right. And it's like, like, and I know Russ was talking about how like he'll go into the gym and just pick out any random guy in the, in the room and just like, start thinking like, Oh, you don't think I can do it? Like, Oh, you don't, you don't believe in me. Oh, like you gotta have, and it, like, you could just be a guy that looked at him uh, away when he walked in or whatever. And he's like, Oh, and he's like, it helps you get fired up. And like in sports, we talk like bulletin board material, 
right? Like some negative stuff you're going to pin up yeah. on the bullet that the other team said about you or whatever it is. So um, I just think it's really interesting, like in the sports psychology side of this whole thing, um, you know, and, and I think uh, to flip it, you know, if people are out there and they're making these excuses, it, not, not saying that Mike or Enrique, but if people are talking on their behalf or whatever right. and, yeah. and, and, and saying things like, well, I mean, in a way it's also another feather in your cap where it's sort of like, they got to come up with reasons why they, and then that's another motivating chip on your shoulder, right? It's like, they got to come up with reasons to try to discredit my win. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's, I think it's cool that you cover this kind of stuff on your YouTube and it's, I, I liked this whole conversation. Yeah. And it's just like a transparent look into like how my mindset goes. Like, like you said, whether it's true or not, it's like, uh, that saying perception is reality, you know? So. I kind of just perceived it for a moment where, you know, maybe there was a little bit of excuses on the behalf of competitors, not by the competitors, trying to be very clear that's the yeah. case. Um, but anything that I can grab a hold of and use for training for that little extra motivation, I'll do it. And I, I think going back, you mentioned like Russell or he doing something similar. I think a lot of good athletes do similar things. And I will concede 100%. Maybe it's an out of portion in my own head. that goal of hard training and it keeps me going, then, you know, that's just by me. Sorry, you cut out there. Um, right when you were saying, maybe I'll admit, so say that again, because <laughs> I think you're saying maybe I'll um, admit that it, I might have made it up a little bit or that it's like partially just in my head. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. I said, um, maybe I'll admit I blew it a little, like it's out of proportion in my mind. But as long as it gets that end result of like a little extra fodder for training, then the ends justify the means on it, I think. 100% bro. I mean, that's, that's, that's such a athlete thing. Like, like I said, like the bulletin board material, um, obviously like mm -hmm. you show up a whole season worth of baseball games, you know, hundred games or whatever you have internal motivation to do that. Like, like you're not going to show up just because someone was like talking shit. Like you, you're, you're showing up because like you're motivated to play baseball and win. But like you said, it's that extra like cherry on top. It's like that extra two or 3%. It's that like extra jolt of adrenaline mm -hmm. that you can get when you when you think about another guy saying something or whatever it is, an opponent or another team said something about you. And it just gives you that little bit of extra edge that you're looking for. And um, so talk about that a little bit, just like your internal motivation versus this external negative versus like a positive motivation. Yeah, that's great. And I think a lot of, you see a lot of lift in general, they'll start off really heavy into the sport because of maybe extrinsic motivation. Maybe they want the idea of winning a powerlifting competition. Um, to a, I seen people in college, you know, old friends in college who would like, they would like the attention in the gym from lifting certain amounts of weights or, um, you name it, there's other reasons people get into the gym extrinsically. If that's all your training's based on, eventually that extrinsic motivation fizzles out. Like, for example, let's be honest, I'm not going to carry this little thing that I felt from nationals five years from now. Yeah. It, this helps me for training. So, if you take that away, a lot of lifters, if that's all they're running on, they'll just fall out of the gym, you know, because mm -hmm. without the extrinsic, they have nothing else that they're lifting for. Um, it has to start intrinsically for it to last a long time. And for me, I like the process of going in to improve myself 
incrementally over years and years. Um, that's kind of the foundation of my lifting. That and like, like the feeling of like doing things that I didn't think were possible at other points in my life, like lifting a certain weight. That's the foundation. And then if you add extrinsic on top of that, exactly like you said, um, then it can just give you these shortened, accelerated bursts of good training or motivation to get like diet right and the little things that otherwise maybe wouldn't be there. Yeah, for sure. I thought that was a really good point. And it was something that, you know, this is a very like athlete mindset. Like you said, I think maybe people who come into, they've only ever done powerlifting. They haven't done these other team sports and stuff. They might think of this stuff as like bad or like, like shit talking or something like this. Um, but like a certain amount of that is nice. Like I said, or like arrogance or something or, or, or something like, you know, um, like, oh, everyone's concerned about Tristan's performance, like when really it's all in his head or something, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> but but, right. Um, but it, it's it's just these things that athletes do and these little tricks that of the trade that you have as an athlete that help you. And and each person's different. And some people have different ways of, of expressing it and different ways of uh, motivating themselves and things like this. So I thought that was a really cool thing um, that I think resonates with a lot of people that have done team sports before and stuff where there is like some talk about, you know, outside and, and that can use it to motivate you. Like famously this year, the chiefs, uh, before the AFC championship game, the Bengals, Eli Apple was like talking a lot about how Joe Burrow owns Arrowhead stadium in Kansas city. And the chiefs were like, we took that personally and they won and they blew up, you know, and, and it was in, it was in a big, right after the mm -hmm. game, they were right after the game, they were talking about it. They were like, they're like, that motivated us. That fired us up. They talked about it on the stage when they're getting the AFC championship trophy and stuff like this. They're like, Oh yeah. Like I think Travis Kelsey said like something about like, you know, next time you won't talk so much, right? Like stuff like this. Um, and, and you see that, like, I remember Blaine Sumner had some battles, mm -hmm. you know, where he had some, uh, bulletin board material that he literally had like a bulletin board of stuff that this guy was talking about. And so yes. it's a thing in sports. So for people who don't know. Yeah, for sure. And I, I don't know, I enjoy those kind of things and it goes with my, um, lifting style as well. You know, I like to use energy to convey to add some adrenaline for a given lift, add some emotion to it. Some lifters are very stoic. We were just talking about how Mike is very much internal. Yeah. Um, honestly, if I had to bet, he probably doesn't rely as much on those kind of things as someone like myself who, you know, gets myself a little bit more fired up on a given lift. Yeah. It's very hard to read Mike T. Um, to be honest, like I would not want to play poker with him. Like you and me seem more like guys that like carry our emotions <laughs> on our sleeve and it would be so easy to read us. Um, Mike T, I don't know what he's thinking a lot of times, but he's funny and, and just as much of a sports guy, like as any of the rest of us. So he probably does. Oh. He probably does. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's like that whole uh, Michael Jordan, like the last, the last dance uh, documentary series. That's kind of what set off that whole thing of Netflix. They saw how good that did. Mm -hmm. And they did a lot of more sports things after that. But um you know, there's that whole phrase where he's like, and I took that personally. And that's like a meme now that's like everywhere. Michael Jordan, you know, he's basically like <laughs> talking about it. And, and like, he's, he was famous for like some guy on the other team who was like a role player said something that like, he was going to shut him down or he was going to and he score 60 on him just for out of spite, like just stuff like that. And it's like you, when you're really good at something, you need those right. little extra edges, even the best of the best Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, these kind of guys they need, they use that to continue to fuel them to take, just get that little extra drop out that they can squeeze out, you know? Yeah. And when you're at the level, um, like percent on your total and make the difference between like winning and losing, you know, those little things add up. Totally. Especially on, in our sport across three lifts and everything. Um, okay. So 
that's that's almost everything I wanted to cover. Um, I know you know the internet situation kind of breaking up and stuff a lot, so maybe we'll cut it up here a little bit short. But just really fast, there's a couple of like quick things I wanted to ask you. Um, and it, man, yeah. you have a, such a history. Like I could keep talking. We've already been going for over two hours, so I don't want to take up more of your night. And I actually have a thing I got to go to as well. But I want to do this again yeah. with better internet um, because like, I feel like I could keep talking to you about stuff <laughs> like so many of these things we go down rabbit holes on. Um, oh, yeah. But, yeah. but um, one thing real quick I wanted to ask about was, did you say on a YouTube video that you're missing an ACL and have a torn meniscus? <laughs> yeah. So my right knee um, in 2018, a car... I was walking across the road on the way to the gym in the winter time uh, at college and a car just like didn't see me in the crosswalk, I guess, and nearly hit me like and I, I jumped laterally out of the way and it was probably less than six inches from actually hitting me. But when I landed, uh, there went my ACL and I got it checked with an MRI and confirmed it along with a tear in my uh, meniscus which it's not folded over or anything so you know it could be bigger issues if that were to happen but essentially at that point i was like seven weeks out from collegiate nationals that year and oh, i was in prep for worlds obviously they suggested that i I get the surgery to repair the ACL, but with knees and ligaments that are that injured, I just really like wanted to avoid surgery if possible. And I knew I had those meats. So I asked the doctor if I could damage it anymore by trying to squat on it. And initially it was very unstable. It's uh, my best description for it is like, when I was walking out of squat, it would feel like my, my knee was going to just hyperextend and give uh -huh. out. Um, and I worked with my coach, Bill McCarthy, which I feel like I haven't shouted him out enough yet, but we've been together for over seven years at this point, starting in 2016. And he has got me to this point to where I am. But I talked with him about small strengthening exercises um, around the knee joint because long story short, an ACL is a ligament that just stabilizes the knee, trying to keep it from hyperextending. And if you can build that muscul musculature up around it with like terminal knee extensions and glute bridges, things like that, um, then you can essentially like your body can deal with it without the ACL. So in seven weeks, I got it from uh, freshly torn to I squatted 705 at that collegiate competition. And uh, I just, I do terminal knee extensions religiously in my training. And I do get some knee pain uh, from a whole lot of volume. So I can tell once I'm getting close to like competition time, it bothers me and walking for long distances. But Otherwise, I've worked around it and I never got it repaired. So uh, kind of fun fact there. Wow, that's wild, man. Yeah, I was like, am I hearing this right? Like he doesn't have an ACL. <laughs> um, that sounds wild. And I've, I actually have heard of, a, you know, like high level athletes have so much muscle around the knee that they don't necessarily need the ACL MCL. I'm not, I'm not, a, I don't know anything about biology, anatomy or whatever, but, but um, I guess there have been basketball players where they've like done x-rays and they're like, holy shit, you don't have an MCL or an ACL or whatever it is. <laughs> and they're, they're just like, yep. And it's all good. I can dunk, I can run, I can, you know, do everything necessary. So. Yeah. And as a power lifter, and this can't be enough, the sport of Thing. so like one dimensional you're moving things up and down that i think that the it doesn't stress the knee as much in different angles that the acl would need to compensate for 
as something like football or soccer where you're cutting and moving in different directions. Yeah, for sure. Okay, bro. I think we're going to have to cut it there for today. Um, cause I got a thing, but it's been a pleasure yeah, talking awesome. to you, man. Um, do you want to just give any thank yous or shout outs to anyone here before we cut off? Oh yeah. Um, so shout, I just shouted out Bill, but once again, you know, he's been that cornerstone for my training for years and years at this point. And, you know, I, he feels like a part of my family, you know, so I wouldn't be here without him. McCarthy, check out, get the lift power lifting on Instagram. Or I think he's got a website. As well, he does some coaching. Uh, he's one of the best there is also, you know, shout out to my family, Natalie, my girlfriend who deals with the long gym hours and everything. I know it can be difficult sometimes, but you know, she, she's a champ and, they all support me. So I really appreciate that. SPD and supplements, those are my two main sponsors. So shout out to them. I certainly, um, you know, it's just fuel to the fire. I hope to represent those brands as best as I can. And then lastly, you all with Powerlifting America, um, just being able to be so athlete focused, I think it's a breath of fresh air that. I finally feel like, you know, you've got a powerlifting federation that's focusing on these and kind of getting us out there from all levels and supporting that, that growth. So I appreciate that from everyone at all levels from Powerlifting America. I'm happy to be a part of such a great organization. Wow. Thank you so much for saying that, man. Um, we're proud of you. Um, it's, we're proud of all the athletes and obviously you guys are the stars. We couldn't do any of this without you guys. So, um, it's, it's, it's an honor to, um, be able to, you know, try to provide some spotlight for you guys, um, because you're such great athletes and you deserve to be treated like, like star athletes, like you are. So, um, that's our goal, but man, I really appreciate your time here. And, um, you got so many great insights. You're like, you're like a wise old man of the sport, even though you're like 27 years old. <laughs> So I feel like, you know, we need to do this again. Maybe we can get on another on one. That. Yeah, maybe we can get on another one, even still here before the North American Championships. Oh, I was going to ask, is your girlfriend and uh, is uh, yeah. Bill, are they coming to North Americans? Yeah, so Natalie will be there. Um, she's coming down the day before, so she'll be there the day of competition. And then we're going to enjoy uh, the Islands a little bit. Unfortunately, I don't think Bill's going to be able to make it. So, um, you know, I, I always feel like I'm in great hands with Bill and I prefer him to be in my corner. But at the same time, I know there's plenty of great um, coaching staff on that North American team. So I'm looking forward to that as well. So you're going to be hand, you're going to your game day coach will be the North American uh, team coaches, the, the, the power of the American yeah. uh, national team coaches. So I think it'll be Vin, Vin Mangione. Yep. Is that right? Uh, honestly, I don't know. Okay. Um, I, I think it'll be Vin. Uh, the head coach, uh, will it be? Okay. Oh, no, it might be. Oh, it'll be Rodney. To read Rodney Elm. Rodney Elm. So. Okay. Helm, Elms? Yeah, Is Rodney Elm. Name? Rodney Elm. Yeah, yeah. So it's the, assi- okay. he was the assistant coach. That's, at- that's who I was thinking it was. I was thinking. Yeah. 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 The assistant coaches, um, we're trying to do a system where the assistant coaches on the world's teams are the head coaches for the North American championship so that they get that head coaching experience, you know, and he was for the nice. open team that just went to Malta. He was like the, the first in line assistant coach, him and Tamara Lopes. So the two of them will probably be doing a lot of the coaching of the open lifters in the North Americans. Um, Vin will be the head coach for the juniors and sub juniors at the North American on the raw side. So anyway, there's going to be a ton of coaches there because they're like all the gotcha. assistant coaches from all the different uh, national teams that are headed to worlds will be there. So we got a lot of coaches on the roster you'll see. So it's going to be fun, man. There's going to be a ton of people there. You'll be in great hands. So, um, I'm looking forward to it. You're going to put on a big performance. I know you've been just wanting to, because I also, we didn't get into it too much, but I know you were injured going into Austin 
So that performance was a little lower than what you were looking for. So I can't wait to see. I know you don't want to talk numbers as far as specifics and stuff, but I think be ready for people that are out there listening to this. Be ready for Tristan to put on a show out here uh, in the Cayman Islands. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All right. With that, um, thank you to everyone that listens. Thank you for coming, Tristan. And thanks, thanks to everyone in Power of Teen America. With that, peace out.